the higher level people, you know, and if you can do something of value or do something of exclusivity and help those people in turn, they will definitely introduce you to their connections if they have them. Welcome back to Young Smart Money with me, your host, Apple Crater. Today in this episode, we're sitting down with Mike Metzger to talk, among other things, about networking and about growing a social media agency. Mike is somebody who came from some tough beginnings, okay? He talks about how he really had his back up against the wall and he really didn't have any other choice other than to go out there and make it happen. So he's going to talk about how he's able to overcome a lot of adversity starting off and how he's able to see some significant growth in his business really in just the last like three, four years. It's really exploded. He's able, to, he's been able to speak on stage uh, amongst legends, meet some really amazing people, and he's going to detail his exact strategies and exact tactics that you can use when you're trying to meet these legends. I know a lot of you guys are trying to start podcasts. You're trying to connect with people who are at that high level, and it might seem like it's impossible to, to meet some of these people. Isn't even intentionally doing these things. So again, Mike's got a ton of value to provide you guys with. He's got a ton of experience under his belt to really back up everything he's saying, and he talks about the importance of that as well. He actually took a, a significant break from social media. He talks about this near the end of the episode for for about two years because he realized that he was talking about stuff that he didn't know if he was actually qualified or that he was actually ready to be speaking on. So this dude, he's taken the time, he's really invested into his business, he's grown into this massive, massive thing, and now he is ready to share with you guys some amazing, amazing insights and strategies and actionable tactics that you can use in order to skyrocket your growth and again meet some really high level people so without further ado i'm going to welcome mike metzger on the show so wherever you are coming at us from today listening to young smart money i want you guys to sit back relax give your full attention to this amazing conversation that i had with mike metzger enjoy all right mike welcome to young smart money how are you doing today hey what's up man i'm good thanks for having me Awesome. Awesome. I'm super glad to have you here today. So our listeners heard a little bit about you in the intro, but for those of them that aren't familiar with you and what you're currently up to right now, could you give us a quick like 60 to 90 second intro of uh, what Mike Metzger is up to right now? For sure. So most people know me for running a digital agency called RVA Social. So I help uh, small, medium, large businesses make an impact with their digital marketing and their advertising. Uh, so my company provides anything from advertising to SEO, web development, all that good stuff. And then on the side, I partner with a lot of different brands, whether it's uh, partnerships to teach you know, their teams about marketing and advertising. I wrote a book called Credibility Method, and I do a little bit of teaching and training and traveling, speaking, pretty much all around digital marketing. Cool. I dig it. I dig it. So yeah, what I want to do now is just sort of flash back a little bit, work our way back up to the present. So talk to us now about your like high school and middle school years. I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by what my guests were doing at this age. So were you somebody who was really into school? Were you starting up side projects? Were you really into sports? What was that uh, time period looking like for you? Yeah, good question. So really the total opposite of, of who I am today. So, uh, <laughs> You know, when I was a kid, man, my, my parents split up when I was young and I, you know, kind of spent most of my young years just kind of angry at life and didn't really have any sort of, you know, vision for the future. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, sure. Definitely had no knowledge of, you know, marketing or digital marketing or anything like that. You know, I'm 29, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, but uh, <laughs> you know, back then, yeah, you know, back then. So it's like... It, you know, there, I played video games and stuff and I was always tech savvy and, and, and whatever, but definitely nothing like m my twenties. So, uh, I was into sports, you know, I wrestled my entire life. So, which is an, an individual sport, you know, you're not really on, you know, you have a team, but your results are based on your own efforts. You, yeah. know, you determine whether you're successful in the sport or not. And I think that taught me a lot about, uh, just kind of self-fulfillment and, taking responsibility for your own results. So that was always great. And wrestling was and still is a big part of my life. Uh, actually, this weekend, my dad uh, will be inducted into the United States Wrestling Hall of Fame. So that's pretty cool. Wow. Congrats uh, to him, dude. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. And so we're talking about like legitimate wrestling, not like yeah. you know, elbowing people off the turnbuckle. <laughs> you know, I was never into that. But you know, like Olympic style wrestling. And so, you know, that taught me a lot. But then during high school, you know, I, I never liked school. I never had any plans to attend college. I probably couldn't have gotten into college if I wanted to. So I did the bare minimum of what I had to do to get by. As far as side projects, you know, I, I wasn't 
naturally an entrepreneur or I guess the way that I would describe it is I didn't know that I had the traits that would make me a, a decent entrepreneur, you know? So, or at least I hadn't discovered them. I didn't realize that those were some of my strengths, but there were little things that I did here and there. So I've, I've always been into music my entire life. And when I was 16, 17, 18, I was really into graphic design. So in high school, instead of taking Spanish class or, uh, you know, taking different electives, I, the classes that I always took were more tech related, you know, so I took computer programming, I took um, graphic design, even art class a little bit played into kind of the graphic design aspect of things. And so I took that and I ran with it. And back in the day when MySpace was around, uh, I would actually make like MySpace layouts for my friends and some of my friends that were in bands and they would pay me on PayPal, you know, so I would charge them a hundred bucks. They'd send me a hundred bucks and make them a layout. They would upload it and, and call it a day. So in a sense, I did learn from a fairly young age what it was like to kind of determine my own income. Now, I never really took it and ran with it the way that I should have because I don't think I recognized what I was doing at the time. You know, I don't think I realized that I had the potential to kind of earn my own income and really do something with it. It was just kind of something on the side that I did for fun and it, you know, put gas in the car or whatever. Sure. So, uh, as I got older, I started shifted, kind of sh started shifting away from that a little bit and just kind of went the regular route, you know, through the ages of 18 to about 24, 25. And I just worked a bunch of different jobs, got fired from pretty much all of them, uh, you know, bounced around from, you know, couch to rental house to back to my parents' house and, you know, bouncing around from different roommates and stuff, uh, all the way till I was about 24, 25 years old. So a little bit of my middle school and teenager years you know, I think slightly headed in the direction of kind of trying to figure out my own thing is being successful, but I never had more than maybe two or 300 bucks uh, to my name at the most, all the way until I was almost 25 years old, you know, so never in, an, in a given day in my life did I have more than a couple hundred bucks to my name. Uh, you know, in, in most cases, I was running around with a couple bucks or 20 bucks um, until I was, you know, well into my mid 20s. So what changed when you hit 25? So it was 24 actually. So in October of 2014, I was introduced to the concept of network marketing. Um, and a lot of people are familiar with that concept. Sure. I was never all that great at it, but you know, I had a lot of friends. So people approached me about it and I don't know what it was, man. At, at 24, there was a lot of stuff going on in my life. I, ha I was in a relationship that was kind of falling apart. I was also living in this house that probably in most cases should have been condemned, you know, and I had just gotten noticed that I had to move out of this house and I had like 30 or 45 days to kind of get my shit together and figure it out. And also, um, I was slowly losing the job that I had. I was working like security at this place called the mansion, which was like a overnight after hours, like nightclub basically. <laughs> and I wasn't showing up and I was, you know, just getting drunk and being an idiot. So slowly losing my job. Um, right around that same time, I had gotten in a motorcycle accident, so I had no transportation, and wow. I didn't have uh, I didn't have a license to begin with. So I was just driving a motorcycle, you know, illegally without a license. Um, you know, so it was just like, and I could go on and on, but basically, it was just these things that were like stacking up on top of each other to where I had my back against the wall, and like something had to give, like something had to change, and it was either I was going to end up probably becoming some sort of homeless drug addict or what happened happened, right? So that those were like really my options. And I think a lot of people are faced, I think some of the most successful people in the world at some point in their life are faced with some sort of dilemma. And it doesn't necessarily need to be just like the one that I faced, but something usually puts their back against the wall to where they either zig or they zag, you know, and they either become successful and figure it out or they don't, you know, and a lot of people, you know, they end up on this downfall to where it, it usually could ruin their life. So, you know, I could have easily gone either way, but I was fortunate because right around that time, to answer your question, I was kind of introduced to network marketing. And what comes along with that a lot of the times is kind of like this positive thinking type of stuff. People start to learn about the law of attraction, get introduced to entrepreneurs, you know, like Grant Cardone, right? Like I see the books you have in the background, right? I spoke with him in August of last year, you know, so like I started to, these people started to get on my radar a little bit. And that was probably the biggest thing was that my entire life, I never was ever shown that I could be successful. You know, school didn't teach me that. Life experiences didn't teach me that. 
there was nothing that ever made me feel confident or even helped me discover the fact that like I could do whatever I wanted to. If I wanted to be successful, if I wanted to be rich, I could do those things. I just had to make the decision to actually do that. And so I never understood that I had those decisions until somebody said, hey man, you know, read this book or hey, did you know that you could, you could determine your own income? You could be like this guy or you could be like that guy. And it was, it was kind of like, it was kind of crazy. It's almost humorous in a way. Years ago, I made this video titled, uh, Why Being Stupid Will Make You Rich. And it's a lot about like that moment in my life because I just understood so little that when somebody said like, hey, you could do this, I was like, oh wow, I could do that? Like, why don't I just do that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was kind of it for me, you know? And, and it wasn't that everything like clicked and all of a sudden everything changed, but that at least put those type of ideas on my radar and started to discover entrepreneurship and you know, some of the first books that I read were um, like the 10X Rule is a good one, but like um, Business of the 21st Century and The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, uh, The Secret and um, The Power by Rhonda Byrne and, you know, Bob Proctor stuff and even like Kevin Trudeau. And so I started like reading all this stuff and I was just like, dude, I've been an idiot like my entire life, you know, and, uh, and that was the beginning of things starting to change for me. And then as I rolled into like 2015, you know, I started to learn about social media and, and stuff like that. So I kind of shifted away from the, the network marketing side of things pretty quickly, but it was an amazing experience. You know, it kind of got me excited about sales and producing my own results again and kind of some of those roots that were kind of like buried, like in a sense, like deep within kind of my personality traits. Like I was always good at sales uh, it was a bit of like a bullshitter back in the day, but obviously as you kind of hone those skills and you, and you kind of shift the way that you think about things and you say, okay, well, I want to be successful. I want to be like a good person. I want to contribute to, you know, humanity and contribute to the people around me. You can take the same skills that make somebody a great bullshitter. And if you focus them on, you know, the positive things in life, you can use those skills and, and really make something great. So that's what I tried to do. And slowly and gradually, you know, my, my results in life started to change. So long story short, to come full circle, like what changed for me was just discovery, you know, kind of self-discovery and at the same time really having my back put up against the wall and I had to make a decision. Um, and my decision was to say, okay, let me eliminate my distractions in life, which were the negative people that were around me, the bad habits that I had, even the job that I had, even though I was about to lose it anyway, you know, just eliminating some of these distractions and, you know, I was fortunate. I was in a position in my life where I didn't have some sort of cushion. You know, it can be terrifying for people with like a full-time career to say, well, oh, sounds, you know, sounds nice. You just had to drop this kind of shitty job and try to do something else instead. And that's true. You know, it's a valid point. You know, somebody who's got, you know, a, a, you know some sort of salary and a, a family, you know, it's much harder for them in a sense than it was for me because I was already at rock bottom. So doing something different wasn't that crazy. Uh, so life was not good, but also in a sense, because things were so not well off for me, it made it easy to just say, well, what the hell, man, I'm just going to do something kind of crazy out of left field and see if I can make it work. And it turned out to be one of the best things I ever did. That's really interesting. And, and, and sort of down a similar line of thought is, is why I tend to tell a lot of younger people, students, especially like, there's never going to be a time where you have less obligations than right now. So you might as well take a chance because you don't have a family, likely you don't have anyone else you're supporting except for yourself. Um, if you still receive support from your parents, like take advantage of that, like take chances because there's never going to be a time where you have less on your shoulders and like less stuff holding you back that like, it, it just makes the most sense. Yeah, no, I agree. I, um, I was surfing through, you know what Quora is? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I was like surfing through Quora. I forget what I was looking at, but I, I saw like somebody ask a question, like, what does it take to be in the 1% or something? <laughs> And somebody replied, like one of the answers was something along the lines of, you know, this person telling their story. They're like, hey, I'm in the 1%, but I remember like when I was almost homeless and I only had like three grand. And, I, like, and as soon as I saw that, I just like stopped reading because I was like, dude, three grand. Like, you know how many people would like kill to have that in yeah. the bank? You know, it's like, it's like, that's crazy. Like how, you know, so I, I see so many people out there that I think they underestimate the amount of resources they have, you know, and, and I hear so many people say like, Oh, I remember this time when I had like 13 bucks, or I remember this time when I had 
47 dollars in my bank account and every time i hear that shit i'm just like dude i like i always only had a dollar in the bank or whatever <laughs> it was you know and 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 i've actually repeated this on a couple of different interviews but i try to drive it home to so many people that are are listening because it's like you don't need like you don't need money like money is not the resource that you need maybe years ago when you know if you wanted to create a startup you needed to have like physical assets but you know when i started learning this stuff in the time period that i'm talking about like this house is falling down i'm losing my job um i'm having to get my dad to come pick me up to take me to his work thank goodness he's a sports medicine doctor so that he could take me and uh help me after this motorcycle accident that i was in right like i had no resources and there's so many people that had it way worse than me i'm not saying like you know i'm not saying oh, I've had it the worst, right? I haven't. However, I definitely didn't have any resources, you know? Even the house that I was living in uh, was being stripped out from underneath me and it wasn't much to begin with anyway. I had a Boost Mobile cell phone. I had this piece of shit laptop that I had borrowed from my grandmother that was like, it was a piece of junk, dude. Like you couldn't even, you couldn't even like take it anywhere. So the point of it being a laptop was completely pointless because if you unplugged it it would just totally die so the battery in it didn't work um you know and and the thing is you can find those types of resources you can get a piece of shit laptop from the thrift store you know i went to boost mobile and got like this little slider phone for 30 bucks and if you can't if you can't put in the work to put together 30 to 100 bucks to figure it out then then you don't have the work ethic it takes anyway so you know, I put in the little bit of work that it took to, to gather those resources. And that's where I started was like kind of when a lot of stuff was falling, falling, you know, falling apart around me. Um, and just with a, you know, a couple of electronics, man, a, a junky laptop and a crappy cell phone that, you know, you couldn't even download Facebook like an app on this phone like that. You know, you couldn't even do that. It would just strictly was for like text and email. And that was it. So that's where I started. And, you know, I hate, uh, hearing so many people talk about, you know, starting and like, Oh, I, you know, I only have a few hundred dollars to my name. And it's like, dude, yeah. I, you know, I just, I think people are, are entitled, man. I think people are, and maybe even entitled isn't the right word. I think, like I said, I think they just underestimate the amount of resources that they have in front of them. Yeah. They're just lacking perspective. For sure. For sure. So talk to me now about how you were first introduced to, to digital marketing because you were in this network marketing company. Um, how did the transition take place between there and now what you're currently doing? Yeah, good question. So, you know, I, I mentioned in high school, I was always good at like graphic design and yeah. you know, I learned Photoshop when I was probably 14, 15 years old. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so I've always been tech savvy, you know, I've always been really good with computers. I was the kid where if our family or even our neighbors, like their internet went out, they would yell for Mike and they'd call me and I'd have to go and, you know, reset the routers and kind of figure it out. And I would even, you know, so I started to learn how to like, you know, log into the router and check the settings. And I just always enjoyed that for some reason. And I liked when it was challenging. I liked being able to figure it out. Um, and, and I think that like deep down, that's kind of where the fascination with just being good at tech stuff started. Um, but to kind of future pace a little bit, what got me into like actual digital marketing and social media and topics like that was in September or October of 2014, right? So not long after I was introduced to entrepreneurship, like the first time I'd ever even given any of this stuff, any thought was like January or February of 2014. By the end of that year, around September, October, um, <clears throat> I met this guy, his name is Rich and this guy named Matt. They were a bit older than me. They were like, you know, early 40s. And they knew some of the guys that were kind of like in this network marketing organization that I was in. It was called Vima. It was like this big thing back in the day where people were selling energy drinks, like going crazy. Right. <laughs> um, and I'm super grateful for the experience because like, I, don't, I don't know where my life would be if I didn't try to give that a shot. Mm -hmm. So, so these guys met kind of like some of the guys in that organization and communication kind of spread, you know, down the, the line of, of uh, reps and affiliates somehow to me. And these older guys were basically trying to like scalp people from this network marketing organization and try to say, hey, come over to what we're doing. And what they were doing was they were selling like online uh, shopping rebates. So basically it was like this little Google Chrome plugin that you could install 
And when you shopped online, you could actually get like cashback rebates. And this is, you know, four or five years ago, which is really funny because now today there's all kinds of extensions like that. Like there's like uh, join honey and there's ebates and there's a ton of them and I use them. But five years ago there, it wasn't really all that heard of. Mm -hmm. And these guys were like, look, man, you can rank YouTube videos based on the products that people are shopping for. And in the video descriptions and in the videos, you can push them to download the plugin and you have your own affiliate link. And so that was like the moment, right? When I was like, wow, so you're saying like, you can track sales by people clicking on a specific link. And they're like, yeah, like Amazon does it, Best Buy does it, Walmart does it, it's called affiliate marketing. And I was like, dude, holy shit, like this is like the coolest thing ever because that was what I loved, man. Like I loved like building websites and building little MySpace layouts and profile. Like I loved that shit, dude. Um, and so that got me excited and I immediately shifted my entire focus. I was like, this is so interesting. And I definitely wasn't good at it, but I, I was excited about it. Hmm. So these guys basically taught me a, a ton of stuff over the course of maybe like six or seven months. Um, and, and that was kind of where it started. You know, and the funny thing is the more I learned, the more that I realized that those guys actually didn't really know a lot, you know, and in, in the beginning, it seems like they do. That's how most gurus and most mentors seem at first. They seem like they know like all this stuff. And then the more you get to know about them or the more you read their material, you're like, oh, these people don't know shit, you know? And, and it is funny kind of in hindsight, but at the moment it was what I needed to get me excited about the digital side of marketing. So long story short, I started to learn about YouTube, uh, started to learn about Instagram. Instagram was a channel that I was always interested in. Even when I was a bartender, when I was 21 uh, or maybe like 22, I was using Instagram to try to get customers into the bar. And I didn't really, I didn't really identify that as marketing just because like marketing wasn't a relevant thing in my life. I was just, you know, I was just trying to be promotional. I was trying to get customers in the bar. Um, so these different channels that I really enjoyed, I was like, wow, I could actually use these to start generating commissions. So once I discovered that concept, then I kind of got fascinated with, okay, what products are going to make me the most money? So I sold everything from like um, TV streaming boxes to like high-end water filters to digital products and software, even like dozens of the software that I even use today in my agency, um, like AppSumo and Hotjar and uh, even Fiverr affiliate stuff, like all these things. That was like really what got me started in social media and digital marketing. And then I went on to create like a blog. So I run a blog called The Social Campus, which generates a ton of affiliate commissions and then I started to learn about webinar marketing and stuff like that. And then, you know, the story goes on and on and how that kind of shifted into, you know, working with celebrities and UFC athletes and big time influencers and speaking with Grant Cardone and working with Patrick Bed David and all that stuff. So it, there's definitely a lot of pieces in between what I just talked about and where I'm at now. But that's what got me interested in this stuff was like a combination of network marketing, which shifted into like affiliate marketing. And that was the core of what started it all and what helped me learn a lot of the skills that turned into like building an advertising agency, basically. Hmm. So one thing that you mentioned there and something that I'm always very fascinated by with my guests and, and their experiences with is, is mentors. And it sounds like these two guys at the beginning, at least were, were at least kind of significant mentors in your life and, and showed you this new business model. Have there been any other really significant mentor figures in, in your journey? You know, not really. Um, and I get this question a lot and I was talking about it recently too. I've had a lot of like virtual mentors, you know, people okay. where I haven't had, and I live in an interesting place, right? I live in Richmond, Virginia, which is, you know, it's not a Miami or a New York or an LA. It's sure. not one of these places. It's a small impactful city, but it's, I mean, dude, you could walk from one side of the city to the other in an hour or so, you know, um, maybe not even like 30 minutes. You know what I mean? Um, it's like, the, the whole city itself is like a couple miles. Mm -hmm. um, but the, what's happening here is it's developing very, very, very quickly. So the reason I bring that up is because there's not like a big entrepreneur community here. And the reason I'm based here is because it allows us to dominate the entire market basically, because there's nobody here that can do what we can do. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to like mentors, there isn't that community to where you could find somebody physically in front of you where you could say, Hey, can you help me? So most of my mentors have always been virtual. 
Um, that guy, Rich, was definitely somebody that I looked up to and that I would consider a mentor. And he kind of took me under his wing and taught me a lot of stuff and looked after me when I first started during that first, you know, six to 12 months of just kind of discovering, I guess you would call it like digital entrepreneurship or, you know, just being an affiliate for stuff online, basically. Um, now, as I kind of shifted out of that, there's, there's really one like pivotal person and his name is Adam. Um, and him and I really dove into webinar marketing. Uh, I worked with a guy's name is Landon Stewart and him and I just kind of like traded skills. Like I actually taught him about Instagram and he started teaching me about webinars because I was way ahead on the Instagram curve and he was way ahead on webinar stuff. So he taught me webinars. I taught him Instagram. As I started to learn webinar marketing, and this is way before people were doing this stuff. Like now today you see webinars everywhere. Yeah. But like I learned webinar marketing in 2015 before anybody heard of Ty Lopez, really, before <laughs> anybody heard of like Lewis Howes or any of these guys, um, they started doing webinar marketing probably like maybe 2016, I guess, like right after that. So I was really fortunate because I got like a really big, uh, I, I got ahead of the curve. I had a big head start on specifically webinar marketing. So what happened in 2015 was I met a guy named Adam Wenig, and he was actually a guy that uh, I traveled out to Miami in 2014 and watched him speak on stage. I didn't know him. We had never met. He was just somebody that I looked up to. I used to watch his YouTube videos for like hours to learn about sales and marketing. The guy was a, a 21 year old seven figure earner, you know, and today he's probably, what am I, 29? He's probably 26, 27, something like that. Um, and we're great friends today, which is hilarious because in 2015, we actually met each other and he was like, Hey man, you know, I've got the money to do whatever we need to do. I've got the budget, but I need somebody that's good on the computer side of things and I'm trying to create a webinar. So my brother actually introduced us and I said, look, let's do it. So we got together and I created, basically him and I together worked on these funnels and worked on a webinar and then I went down to Florida, wrote the video script and filmed the videos and then we ran the ads to basically generate leads for his webinar. And that webinar that we built together went on to enter the two comma club for ClickFunnels uh, and earn over a million dollars in easily less than a year. So. 2015 to 2016 was the bulk of starting to learn more of the innovative stuff and what I would call like real advertising and marketing, learning webinars, running Facebook ads, running Google ads, running Instagram ads. And again, like we were just ahead of the curve before everybody started doing this stuff. Um, so we were super fortunate and, you know, I was able to learn by kind of using his budget, but I'm doing the work. Um, and of course, that's how an agency works now is you take somebody else's money and you manage it for them. Um, but that was able to give me a ton of experience before, you know, everybody was popping up saying, oh, I run an agency, I run an agency, whatever. Because um, now it's like everywhere you turn, people are saying that stuff. Um, but I was, you know, I was lucky in a sense because I met Adam and had the opportunity to really do that. So he was more of a partner, but there was definitely a bit of mentorship that came from him because he was obviously more successful than me at the time. Um, you know, we became great friends and I got to work with him a bunch. So 2015 was a big year after, after meeting Adam and becoming friends with him, pretty much all my mentors have been like virtual, you know, reading books, listening to podcasts. And to me, it's, there's no difference. Like to me, I don't care if this person is in front of me or just in a podcast that I'm listening to. My goal is always to learn and keep moving forward and acquiring new skills. So if it's, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm listening to Donald Miller on a podcast or if I'm, you know, hanging out with Dan Fleshman and Grant Cardone and some of these other people, you know, even some of my clients are people that I look up to, um, you know, so you could consider them mentors in a sense. A lot of times I'm going out to their events and stuff. Um, I'll be leaving in a week to go to Patrick Bed David's conference from May 1st to May 4th. And we ran all the ads for that event, but I'm still going there to learn from the event that we were running ads for, you know what I mean? So mentorship is one of those topics to me where like, it's not always an individual person because I've always had trouble finding like a real physical mentor. Uh, they are much more deep seated in the books and the things that I'm listening to and the events that I'm attending um, versus like somebody that I'm meeting, you know, at a, at a, you know, networking session or something like that. You know what For I mean? sure. So at this point, clearly you're, you're very well connected. I mean, you've dropped a lot of names that, that I'm sure a lot of our listeners are very familiar with. Can you talk to us about your process of networking and how you were able to grow your business network and connect with some of these high level individuals, um, Grant Cardone, Dan Fleshman, all of these guys? Yeah. And, and that's a great question. And so, um, I'll, I'll answer it the best that I can, but that sure. question exactly is actually why I wrote my book. 
Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit, but mm -hmm. that was why I wrote that book is because people ask me that question all the time. And it's a very, very difficult question to answer because it's not something you can just answer in like two minutes, but sure. the best way I can describe it is it really is like a domino effect. You know, you really want to make those kind of medium level connections that can introduce you to the higher level people, you know, and if you can do something of value or do something of exclusivity and help those people in turn, they will definitely introduce you to their connections if they have them most of the time, you know, and you got to be good at what you do. That's the first piece, you know, and um, I always find myself repeating the same shit half the time, but it's so true. It's like I live by these principles. So of course I say them over and over again, but so many people say like, oh, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know, but it's like, no dude, like that is not true. It is all about what you know, because what you know and the skills that you have is what determines who talks to you, who you're around. It determines everything. So my first piece of advice is just honestly ignore the people and just focus on the skills. And that's what I did is I took like probably over two years to where like I was just head down, blinders on learning this stuff. And because of that, I was able to get in front of the right people in, you know, at an event, you know, funnel hacking live. Um, and Adam was a big part of that too, you know, cause he was in the inner circle for click funnels. So you know, we got to meet a lot of these high level marketers and stuff. And, um, it, you know, it is funny because looking back at some of those people, a couple of them are clients of mine. And it's not necessarily because I met them at Funnel Hacking Live, but you're starting to get into that sphere of influence just by kind of, just kind of like making these small connections here and there. But what I can say is like, you always just want to look for that first kind of domino that you can knock over. And when that happens, you got to be ready and have the skills to be able to fulfill that opportunity. You know what I mean? Because who cares who you meet if you can't do something to last in, in their mind as some sort of resource that they can refer to later or send somebody business to? Because the more successful you get, the more people are trying to hand you shit, the more people are trying to do you favors, the more people are trying to give you referrals and connect you with people. So like, that's why I say you got to find like these medium level people. Um, even a lot of the people that you probably interview on this podcast are great examples. Um, you mentioned Alex, you know, he knows a ton of people, man. Um, that's, you know, that's my best advice. And in a sense, man, podcasts are, are genius because it is a great way to create content and create value, but also just have a genuine conversation with people who can give you good advice and connect you with the right people. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Events, podcasts, emails, social media, you know, hitting people up in, in direct messages, running ads. Um, there's a million different ways to do it. Even sending like a direct mail package to people to try and just break, break the ice a bit, you know? Um, there is no one clear cut answer because everybody's different. The skills that you have are different than the next person. So it is tough, but I would say make a list of the dominoes that you want to knock over and eventually you'll get one and one will turn into more. Um, like a, a real life example would be, uh, one of my good friends, Jackson, he's a radio host around here. Um, you know, and, and he's introduced us to all kinds of people. So you meet a radio host and then all of a sudden they're introducing you to, you know, triple pat platinum recording artists, you know? And so I've met uh, James Arthur because of him and Aaron Carter and some of these, you know, recording artists and stuff. I've met Tory Lanes, and, you know, that all happens because like you meet somebody who's like the connector between those things. So if you're saying, oh man, I want to meet, uh, Grant Cardone, or I want to meet uh, Tony Robbins. It's like, okay, well, who are some of the smaller names that maybe share the stage with those people, right? So kind of break it down and come up with a plan because you can't, you know, all kinds of people are tweeting Grant every day. So it's like, okay, well, how can you do something different? So find that smaller domino that's eventually going to bump into somebody like Grant or Tony or whatever, you know what I mean? That's, that's my best advice on kind of how I've made those connections. And it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, you know? Absolutely. And I think when you, when you brought up that, that idea of having a high value skill, that's really important and something that I think a lot of people neglect when they're trying to for network. Sure. They don't invest into themselves first. They don't make themselves a person of value before they try to associate with people of value. And like, if you're not bringing anything to the table, no one's going to let you have a seat at the table because you're not contributing. Like you are not bringing anything new or novel or valuable to anyone. So they're not going to give you their time of day because like these big guys like Grant Cardone, like Tony Robbins, I mean, like they're busy. They have a lot of things on their plate. And if you yeah. aren't clearly adding value to them, you're not going to get any of their time. So I think that's a really, really important thing to really 
lock in something of value that you can bring to the table first. Definitely. Talk to us now about that first domino and how our listeners, say we have a 16, 17, 18 year old listener here who wants to start that, that trail chain of dominoes um, falling. What, what are your best strategies or what are some good tips that our listeners can use when they're reaching out to that first domino? Like what are some things that they should be sure to either include or exclude from that first sort of direct outreach to that person? Yeah, great question. So I think a lot of the times people are always focused on, you know, like what they are doing, right? So they're focused on, oh, what am I saying? All this and that. Sure. At the end of the day, what you say doesn't matter. As soon as you can get in contact with that person, you want to think of what happens from there forward. And so what I'm referring to is if I'm reaching out to some sort of big influencer or a big company, it could even be a, a doctor that just runs a multi-million dollar business, what happens after I communicate with them? And the answer is always going to be, they're going to look you up, dude. You know what I mean? Like they're going to look into you or your company or who you are. So think about what you look for when you just want to go to a restaurant or you want to figure out who somebody is. You know what I mean? Let's say you watch a, a TV show or even just scrolling through Instagram or you, you're listening on the radio. Like as soon as you hear about something that is of interest to you, you look it up. And the question is, where do you look it up? usually on Google or some sort of social media platform like Facebook or Instagram. You know, like sometimes I know when I see like a, like I'll see like a new actor that's like kicking ass and it seems like cool. Like think of like, think of like the stranger things kids. Like when you see them, you're like, Oh, that's cool. I wonder what they're like in real life. And then you look them up, you look them up on like Instagram or something. Now it's not to say that you need to be some sort of famous actor, but at every level people are looking you up. So you want to start from that point forward and think about, okay, what are the channels and pathways that people can discover me? And when they do discover me, what is that first impression that they're receiving? And that is the biggest piece of advice is, uh, that I can give people is control the first impression that people get when they discover you. In, in the email that you send, you know, have a professional signature and make sure that it's coming from a legitimate domain name. Um, make sure that your Google results have your name, you know, and it's tough if your name is like Sean Smith, you know, it's almost impossible to rank number one on Google, but start thinking about that. Start thinking about, okay, well, if I can't rank for my name, what can I rank for? Maybe it would be a company name. You know what I mean? Not everybody's is as fortunate to have like really weird, unique names like you and I, you know what <laughs> I mean? Um, but you got to just think ahead about how can I control the first impression that people see when they find me, when they find my brand, or when they hear about me, or, or when I reach out to them. Um, and so that includes your Instagram channel, your Facebook page, your email address, and what your email looks like, your website, or your company website, um, your reviews, and your reputation, if that's, you know, if that applies to your business. Not every business or brand has reviews, you know, but for me, people hear about me, and they look me up. They're immediately going to see that I've got a book on Amazon. I've got a Amazon Prime uh, special that is on video for Amazon Prime Video. They're going to see that there are ads running on my term. They're going to find my website and my company website. When they look up my company, they're going to see literally dozens of five-star reviews. So when that happens, I don't need to say anything. Those assets speak for me. Um, and that is what these, you know, dominoes to, to come full circle and answer your question. That's what they're looking for, you know? And it's tough. You know, it takes years to build that stuff up. It takes time. It takes money. It takes experience. Um, so it is tough. But that's the best way to answer that question is like, don't get so caught up in what you're saying and how you're reaching out to these people because, you know, imperfect action is much better than perfect inaction. You know, so don't get concerned with like every little detail of like, oh, should I say hey or should I say hello or should I say what's up or like how should I message that person? It's like, dude, none of that even fucking matters. Like just take action because the reality is 80% of these people are not going to respond minimum. You know, they're just not going to respond. That's just how it is. Just like you mentioned, Tony Robbins, especially, dude, he's not answering nobody, man. No. He's not answering me either. You know what I mean? So that's what people need to think of is, Take the first steps. Don't get caught up in the details. Be much more focused on the details of what happens if they actually give you the time of day. What happens then? Because people get so caught up in like, oh, I'm going to put in all this effort of like contacting 100 people. But it's like, dude, you don't want to worry about 
the 20 that answer you back, you want to wonder, you want to wonder about the five that actually look you up. That's what's important. So that would be like my best answer or advice to that question. Yeah, I really like that. And just thinking a couple of steps ahead of like, okay, this person sees my message. What do they do next? That's a step that I don't think a lot of people take. And I know I personally do that a little bit subconsciously in just like making sure that everything that I put out there is reflective of of the message that I want to send to people. And making sure that, again, like my Google search results are, are things that I'm proud of and things that represent me and my brand. But I think that is something that not a lot of people are taking into account when they're reaching out to people that they want to make a good impression with. And your reputation can be a really valuable asset to you if you are effectively utilizing it and being really mindful of, of what it looks like. But again, like you said, you got you to put in that time and really invest into it and be conscious of what, that, what that's actually going to look like for someone. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. So Mike, you're definitely working on a lot of different things. They're all in a very similar field, but like, how do you establish on like a day to day, week to week, month to month, where your focus is going to go? And like, how do you decide where to invest your time, energy, resources into um, when working on different projects? Yeah. Another good question, man. Um, and, and this is kind of one of the little like secret, uh, secret little nuggets that I usually share Ooh. at events. Cause I, I get the, I get this question often too. So um, what I do and what my entire company does is we use a process called Kanban. Um, and you can just look it up on YouTube. It's called Kanban. Basically, the concept itself was created by the Toyota company. You know, so Toyota company creates all these cars and, you know, they're trying to manufacture vehicles, you know, thousands and thousands at a time. So they came up with this process and it's really simple. It's basically just a set of columns and you move tasks through the columns and that's it. So to explain it in a little bit more detail, because it can get a little, not complicated, it's actually really simple, that's the whole point of it, but there are little details that you should be aware of if you want to utilize it the right way. But the basic concept is you have a backlog column, which is stuff that needs to be done, but not right now. You have a to-do column, which is stuff that needs to be done, and it needs to be done right now. Then you have an active column, which is stuff that is in progress and being done, and then you have a completed column, which are tasks that have been completed. The way that we break it down is we have an entire annual calendar. Um, so we have, a, um, we have a big annual calendar that's listed out by week. So basically it's 52 columns for each week of the year. Um, and at the end of every week, we take, a, we take all the task notes, the little post notes for all the tasks that have been completed, and we stick them at the end of the week before we leave the office for that week. Now, when we, now to kind of break that down a little bit on a weekly basis, we're using a separate board that has all those columns, right? So it's got a backlog. It's literally right here behind me where, <laughs> you know, if you, if you're watching, like it's literally behind my computer, I look at it every day and we have one in every single office room. Um, so it's a backlog, a to do column, uh, an active column and a, and a done or completed column. So on a weekly basis, every day when we're coming in here, I'm looking at the to do column and I say, okay, um, we got to finish this onboarding. We got to get this uh, website started. We got to get this proposal sent over. Uh, we got to get an estimate for this website and browser based app. And we got to finish putting together this complimentary strategy that we were going to do for a friend, right? So that's in like a to do column. Then as those things get completed throughout the week, you move them through the columns. And that's pretty much it. And again, just search it on YouTube, you know, it'll show you. But that is what we stick to to get things done. And then I've got a daily, you know, everybody has their own individual daily to-do list. So that way, you know, the, we've got a big annual calendar that kind of tracks things almost month by month. Then we've got our board on the wall, which tracks things throughout the week. And then you have like a to-do list on your computer and on your phone that tracks things almost, you know, individually throughout the entire day. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what keeps me on task so that when I wake up every morning, I know exactly what I need to be working on. Hmm. I love it. So when did you expand your team beyond just yourself? When, when did that shift take place? Yeah. So it's kind of funny, like in a sense, it's kind of like interesting because I, I had like salespeople all the time that like I kind of would take under my wing. So when I was doing affiliate marketing, the more that evolved, I really realized that the, the big opportunities were in like high ticket stuff. So I told you I was like fascinated with finding like the biggest and the best and the most expensive products. And so I ended up getting an office building that has now since like transformed into my agency. But when I first moved into an office and it was risky, you know, I was like, I went from working in my bedroom in 2015 um, 
to then starting to think and what, okay. So what had happened was I started inviting like my friends over to start learning what I was doing because I wanted people to get on the phone. I was a great salesperson, but I can only be on, I'm only one person. So I could be on the phone for the entire day and no matter what, there's a maximum capacity of what I could get done and how many sales I could make. Right? So what we would do is we'd run webinars, generate leads, schedule the calls. I'd get on the call and we would sell products. Um, a really good example is we were selling like high end water filters. That's, you know, they're like these big in home, like full house water filtration systems that sold from anywhere from like a couple grand to like almost nine grand. Right. And you can make huge commissions on them. And the more you sold, the bigger the commissions got. So that was like, when I was like, man, I should teach like some of these, these young guys that are always reaching out to me saying like, Hey Mike, how do I become successful? How do I make a lot of money? How do I get into marketing? How do I get into sales? I'm like, dude, I need to take these people under my wing, show them what I'm doing and get them on the phone to sell for me. But then the more I started having people in my house, the more my girlfriend was like, dude, like you need to get these kids out of the house because like, this is crazy. This is our apartment. Like we live here. You know what I mean? Um, and so I was like, okay. So I started looking at co-working spaces and all the co-working spaces around here were full and didn't have any, you know, vacancy. So I was like, man, well, I wonder how much it would cost to get an office building or an office space. So I started looking at office spaces. I found one that was close to my house. I went and looked at it and that's where I'm at right now and looked at it. And I was like, dude, this could be pretty cool. I could rent out this room, right? And the room was as much as the rent in my entire apartment was at the time. So this is like three years ago, maybe almost four years ago now. Um, yeah, three years ago. So I was looking at this, at this place and I was like, man, I could get this room and get desks and get a couch and then everybody could be on the phone and we wouldn't bother anybody we'd be here as long as we want so that's what i did so in a sense like i expanded beyond myself when i did that but i didn't have like employees you know these weren't people that were on payroll that were my employees or my staff they were just people that were excited about making commissions i got like a communal space for them to use and i said yo let's go here every day let's bang the phones and let's make some money and that's what happened so that was when I first kind of like expanded beyond myself. The more I did that, the more I realized that my strengths and what I really enjoyed and wanted to do were just in that digital marketing space. Because on the side, I was always having people start to reach out to me, you know, a real estate agent saying, hey, help me with Facebook ads, uh, a friend, you know, a lawn care company saying, hey, help me with Instagram, uh, somebody saying, hey, you know, help me build my website for my car dealership. So I was always doing that stuff on the side. And so uh, what happened was like these sales guys, you know, they were young, you know, young, and there's nothing wrong with being young, but like, they just weren't, dude, they weren't living up to like what I, what, what my vision was and what I wanted to see happen. So as they kind of started to like trickle down and kind of fall away from what I was doing, um, I started to transition into like, man, I should really run a marketing company. When I came up with that idea, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it. So I gave it a name, I put up a website and just took action, right? I talked about like imperfect action and it was definitely not perfect, you know, but I did it. And so I got a few clients that were paying me some money and I was like, yo, this is like, this is cool. This is what I want to do. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So um, very quickly I got busy and the only person I knew that I could trust that had a good handle on what I was doing was my brother. So my little brother's like, three and a half years younger than me. He was living in Jacksonville at the time in 2016. And I called him and I said, Hey man, um, I forget like the exact scenario, but basically I was like, Hey dude, come up and visit. Oh, I think I went down to Florida to visit. And I was like, dude, you should come back with me, hang out for a few weeks, see what I'm doing, see this office space that I got. I'm um, going to hang out and help me with some of this stuff. Um, Cause he's really good at advertising and he's a much, he's even in a sense like more techier than I am. So he came up to help. And dude, literally never even went back. Like he had a whole apartment there and everything. Dude, he just kept paying rent and staying here because we got so busy. So we just left that apartment down there completely empty. We got super busy here. Um, and then my buddy Mike, who lived in California, actually was trying to build his own agency there. Ended up shutting the whole thing down because it was so frustrating for him. And he called me and was like, dude, I need your help. And I was like, dude, like to be honest, man, if you're out there, like I don't know how I can help you. And if you're just a one man show, dude, like, I, you know, I don't know. And especially if you don't know how to do a lot of this stuff. And uh, he was like, well, would you be open to me like coming to learn from you? I was like, dude, just move out here and just come work here. And he did. So he packed up all his shit, closed down his business, moved all the way here to Virginia 
and that was how it started was just us three. And that was like the first staff that I had, um, was me and Mike and Matt and, uh, and dude, we just started kicking ass. And then we ended up taking over the whole office building here, um, and just grew into what it was, you know? And so now we work with, um, you know, multi-million dollar nonprofits here in the community. All of the top restaurants in this area are all clients of ours, all the professional sports teams, um, you know, have us do all their marketing and their ads and sell tickets to their events. We're partnered with all the local universities and have internship programs with them. Um, you know, and then we work with some of the top like influencers. We kind of have like this little pocket of like big time speakers and influencers that don't really fit in that like local business bubble. You know, they're more of like people like you and I, um, and that's just come from creating my own personal reputation and it all falls under the umbrella of my agency and it's, it's become crazy, you know? So I know it kind of rambled there, but that's kind of how it started, man. Like it, it wasn't like I just said one day, like, man, it's time for me to hire somebody, you know, it kind of happened gradually and it kind of transformed from like commission based salespeople into my brother and my homie, Mike moving over here. Um, and then expanding out and hiring other staff and contractors and stuff like that. Mm. I love it. I love it. So talk to us a little bit about that process of hiring those first salespeople for you. And honestly, just like some actionable pieces of advice for like the 18, 19, 20 year old who's listening to this show right now, who, who wants to get better at sales, who wants to develop that skill set, because again, that's a skill that can be used in, in really any kind of scenario. So what are, what are some steps and what were some things that you were teaching those early people that you were bringing on to, to do some sales for you? Yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, most of it, man, is almost just like, I call it pig-headed discipline. And, and I didn't come up with that. I learned it from Chet Holmes, who wrote a book. He passed away in like 2015, but he wrote a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine. And if I could recommend any book on like how to make a million bucks, dude, like that is the most straightforward book on how to become wildly successful. It's called The Ultimate Sales Machine. So um, I took that kind of mindset that Chet teaches. And also like Steve Jobs is somebody who was very much like this. And he called it something else and everybody has their own name for it. Like Steve Jobs, people referred to it as like the reality distortion field. And in a sense, you could call it, you could call it whatever you want. You could call it being naive. You could call it being an idiot. Um, but I've always had this thing like instilled in me to where I'm dumb enough to believe like, dude, I can get anything done. Like, I don't care what it is. Um, I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it takes. I don't care how hard it is. I'm like, no, that's fine. It'll be easy. We'll get it done. And there are definitely times when that can bite you in the ass. You know what I mean? Uh, you can definitely bite off more than you can chew and not be able to handle a certain situation or not be able to afford a certain project. Like those are real risks that you take. But the, the way that this r relates to sales and what I tried to teach and instill in everybody that I come in contact with and everybody that's, that I've worked with or that's worked for me is that you follow up until the sale happens. The thing is like you've got to be this like polarizing person. And it happens in, in everything. It's either like buy or don't buy, subscribe or don't subscribe, follow or don't follow, right? Success or don't succeed. So many people like live their life and their operations in like this gray area in the middle and they don't like, not only do they not personally choose, but they don't force their potential customers and potential clients and potential leads to like pick a side. They're so worried about like, tending to everybody's feelings and they're like, Oh, they're going to get offended. Right. And things will start to change if you create a company because you don't want to piss somebody off. Cause the reality is they will leave you a bad review or be like, this person's a dick or they'll leave you a bad review. Right. Uh, and, and they could ruin your reputation. So as the years have gone on, I, I have learned, but if you're a salesperson, like if we're talking about sales, you've got to have like, what I call, and like I said, pig headed discipline. You know, there were times where I would follow up with hundreds. I, I mean, people like hundreds of people for over a year at a time, sending them emails, following up, Hey, just checking in on this. Hey, just following up on this. Um, and it's a valuable skill to learn, um, learning how to not worry about like pushing the envelope, right? Mm. You want to push things to the limit until they get done. And I think that's a really valuable skill to have. And again, it can bite you in the ass, you know, I'm not saying it always works, but you know, a lot of the times, especially as an agency, like you're trying to collect like digital assets from people, you know, you're following up with people who have access to softwares that you don't have access to. And when you need shit get to get done, 
you know, like for example, if we're trying to get conversion tracking set up on somebody's ad campaigns, but we don't have access to the account or the software that's used to sell tickets, dude, I'll follow up with people literally every day for three weeks at a time. Hey, following up on this. Hey, following up on this. Hey, what do we need to do in order to get this done? Hey, how can I help get this completed? Hey, we still have this task on our to-do board. What needs to be done? Hey, and then I'll call them and I'll leave a voicemail. And as soon as I leave a voicemail, I'll email them again. Say, hey, just gave you a ring, left you a voicemail. Call me back as soon as you get this. Dude, I will do that until the thing gets done. Um, and that was like the mentality that I carried into sales. And the, 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 um, the complimentary piece to that is that understanding if you're selling something to somebody, it better be a solution and you better be helping somebody move forward. And I think the reason that a lot of people aren't confident about that and don't make sales is because they're hawking up a bunch of shit to people. You got to really care about what you're doing. You got to really care about the products that you sell and that you offer. And if you do, and you genuinely feel like they will fix somebody's solution, you should feel morally obligated to offer that to somebody. And that's how we feel about like our digital marketing solutions. We know that we're the best in our area. And we say that on everything, you know, when people find us, it says the number one digital marketing agency in this area. Um, and I don't care who calls us. We'll say that, you know, the other agencies could call that and I'll sell it. I'll tell them to their face that we are better than them because we just genuinely believe that we are. And again, I think that's like the perfect essence of like pig headed discipline. And it's called pig headed because like, it's kind of, um, it's aggressive and like it can kind of be rude and you know and some people could argue that it's not even true right like some people could have that opinion of like oh they're not the best right but like you got to have the courage to not give a shit and I, I just carry that with me very close to my heart and it's how I operate and it's how I get things done it's how I make sales um and it's also how you make the people that you sell to feel very confident about what they're buying so that's my best advice for salespeople and it doesn't fit with everybody's personality. So like if that is the uncomfortable feeling or thought for you, then it might not match your personality. And the worst thing you can do is try to like be something that you're not because when you're selling to people, they will see right through it. People know when you're lying. People know when you're full of shit. People know when you don't care. They can hear it in your voice. Um, you know, so if you're selling something that you don't care about, people will know. And if you try to do what I just said, and it's not like a, it's not something that you feel matches your personality, people will know. So, but based on what I know and what I've learned, that's my best advice of a trait that people should try to pick up and try to learn and try to live by if it makes sense for them. Mm, I really, I really like that. And, and that moral obligation to sell to people is something that I really picked up from Russell and the ClickFunnels community when I was at the uh, Funnel Hacking Live event uh, a few months ago now. And nice. I think that's just really, really key to, to really, you, you got to believe in your product. Cause if you don't believe in it, if you're not a product of the product, how are you going to expect anyone else to be half as passionate as you yep. are about it? If you aren't just repping that every single day and showing people that it works and showing people that you believe in it. Like if, if that's not you, then how can you expect anyone to have any fraction of confidence in your product at all? It just, exactly. It's not happen. Yep. All right, Mike, I could talk to you literally all day, but I do want to respect <laughs> your time. And I have some questions that I like to wrap up the show with. Ask all my guests. Uh, are you feeling ready for them? Yeah, man. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So the first thing is, uh, what is something that you are genuinely excited about right now? This could be in your business, in the wider realm of the world, but what's something that genuinely has uh, Mike Metzger excited right now? Yeah. Man, so I'm, I'm really excited right now because I'm actually house shopping. So like I'm literally in the middle of like, you know, we had to reschedule this interview. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm shopping for houses, dude. So I'm super excited about that. Um, that's like in the forefront of my mind, you know, like I keep getting distracted at work because I'm <laughs> flipping through listings and looking at all kinds of shit. So that's super exciting. Um, even more exciting is probably just like summer. Uh, summer for, for our type of business and, and where I live specifically is just like, not only is it a gold mine for business, but it's just fun, man. It's fun. Like I live in Virginia. It's such a beautiful area to where like, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. Like we live on the river here and it's just, it's a, it's an awesome place, dude. So if you ever get the chance to check out Richmond, Virginia, you should, mm. but it's just, um, it's an amazing place to be. So every time this year, you know, this time of year rolls around, uh, we usually get pretty excited because there's a lot of events. Um, we're like one of the number one top like brewery cities, you know, so there's all kinds of like craft beer and cool, uh, festivals and music and there's just awesome stuff going on, man. So that's probably what I'm most excited about. I love it. So you're, you're clearly, you're putting out a lot of content right now. Is there any content that you are consuming, whether that's books, audiobooks, podcasts, um, YouTube channels you're subscribed to? Yeah. Um, 
and I am putting out a lot of content. Thanks for noticing. Yeah. Um, quick little side note on that is like, I've over the years of being in the digital marketing space, I always felt like I really needed to reach like a pretty critical level level of success before I start telling other people what to do. Hmm. When I first started, like I was just out there rambling and saying a bunch of shit to people like, Oh, post on Instagram every day. And you know, all this stuff. Um, and, and you know, I don't know what made me change kind of my mood or tone about it, but somewhere along the line, I, I felt like a, like a faker almost, you know, you know, like a few years ago, I was like, dude, I'm not some like millionaire marketing coach, you know, like who am I to be telling people anything? And I think honestly, it was probably a level of awareness and also learning about other like really highly successful marketers. The more I started to learn about marketing, the more I realized how much I didn't know. So a couple of years ago, I was like, dude, I'm not going to be the guy who's making videos all the time telling people what to do because I knew I had the foresight to know that if I did that in a few years, I would look back and be like, dude, I was an idiot just talking about some shit, right? So it's kind of tough because it is hard to make the distinction of like, man, so is Mike saying like, don't get started creating content? The real answer is I don't know. You know, I don't know. But what I can say has worked for me and what I feel really good about is that I did take the time to block off distractions and not post on social media 15 freaking times a week and just say, dude, I'm going to take two years and I'm really going to learn this. Like I'm going to learn this to the point where I'm better than anybody that I run into. I'm not going to go to some event and sit next to somebody and meet them and they're going to be talking about some shit and I don't know what they're talking about. So I made a goal of like really becoming an actual expert in this topic before I started talking about what I knew and what I've done and my results. Um, and so last year was really that year for me where I was like, dude, we know what we're doing. You know, we're providing like serious results for clients. Um, I'm being invited to speak with some of the, the top entrepreneurs in the world. Um, it's time. And so as I rolled into 2019, I was like, all right, dude, I feel really confident that when I open my mouth, I'm saying something that will actually help people. And there's not, you know, it's not going to be a waste of my energy and time and effort. And it's not going to be leading other people in the wrong direction because I'm talking about some shit that I don't really know about, or maybe I only know 40% of what I really should be sharing. So, um, so anyway, the reason I bring that up is because I'm, I'm glad that you noticed I've been pushing out content because that was kind of like my benchmark for the year was like, okay, 2019, like I'm ready to actually share what's happened and what I've learned over the past three years. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and to a lot of people, man, you know, it looks like I've blown past people because I have. And it's because I didn't get distracted by posting on freaking Facebook every day. Um, I just kind of toned that down just enough to where I was still relevant, but I was focusing on, you know, putting in like Malcolm Gladwell says, 10,000 hours, dude, like, a, like minimum, you know, minimum putting that in over the course of, you know, even just in a couple of years. And now that that's happened, I've been pushing out content like crazy. But to answer your question, um, the type of content that I consume is really all of the above. Um, I do read physical books, but I've found that I'm a lot better at listening to audiobooks. Um, I just find it like more, it's easier for me to pay attention. I'm great at writing. When it comes to reading, I just tend to get distracted. Like you ever sit there and read a book and you flip like 20 pages, but then you're like, wait a minute, I'm flipping pages and my eyes are going across the words, but I'm not actually like absorbing it. Yep. Um, I'm guilty of that a lot. You know, I'll flip past 30 pages and I'm like, oh shit, I got to go back and like literally just do this again. For some reason, I feel like I pay attention to audiobooks much better. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy audiobooks and I can speed them up. You yep. know, so I can speed up an audiobook and really listen to it. So I really like podcasts. Um, Donald Miller is somebody that I follow pretty intensely. Um, he's just so straight to the point and gives you very, very basic, simple tips. I listen to him all the time. Um, literally probably every day. You know, he's got so much content to where like every morning mm -hmm. I can just put on a couple minutes and and it's great. So I do that a lot. I listen to a lot of different podcast interviews. Um, and honestly, I listen to myself and I learn a lot about that. And I don't mean I listen to myself to like, Oh, I just learned a new tip. Like, you know, I've got a lot of videos of me speaking and, and old podcast interviews and I like to listen to them. And a lot of times I'm editing this stuff or my team is editing it. So I'm hearing it anyway. And I can start to pick out, wow, I'm saying so many filler words or I'm doing, you know what I mean? So you'll send me a copy of this and I'll be like, dude, I said, um, like 50 times or I'm always looking for those mistakes and how I can improve upon my own content and what I'm doing. So obviously there's two different objectives in the type of content that I'm listening to, 
Um, but listening to yourself is a great way to get better at what you do and what you're putting out there to the world. So both of those things, man, podcast interviews, audiobooks, and even listening to myself. A hundred percent. I do the same thing. And I can tell that you're very conscious of the way that you hold yourself and the way that you're speaking. And it, that just comes from listening to yourself time and time again, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you, man. For sure. One other thing that I'm very curious about is what my guests do that doesn't scale. So to give you a quick example, I'll send, I'll pull my phone every single day, send like five to 10 video DMs to just random new followers on Instagram, just saying like, Hey, what's up, Mike? My name's Apple. Thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate it. If, if there's any way I can help you out, let me know. Have a wonderful day. So I'm super simple like that. Um, and it's not something that I choose to scale. I don't have one of my VAs just do that for me all day because yeah. that just wouldn't, it's not the objective that I'm trying to get out of it. But is there anything that comes to mind for you off the top of your head that, that you do in your business that has that personal, like Mike Metzger touch to it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, we kind of touched on it earlier about like, kind of like collecting these like digital assets. And it's something I talk about a lot. Like at almost every live event I'm at, somehow it gets brought up. It's brought up in my book and a lot of times on interviews like these. It's something that like you can't shortcut it, you can't scale it, and most people that figure it out aren't going to tell you how to do it. So when I talk about like assets, right? Like I think about my journey that I've been on to getting verified on Instagram would be a good example, right? Getting verified on social media. Those little tokens that you need to collect on the way to get there, like you can't scale that, you can't automate that, you can't, or it's, you can't outsource it, like you just can't. Um, you know, getting onto the Google knowledge panel, like you can't just make that happen, you know? So over time, I've had to really like calculate what steps I want to take to getting a book on Amazon, getting a special on Amazon Prime Video, uh, being able to get Google to recognize my name and pull up a knowledge panel for me. Uh, you know, getting, you know, getting, uh, you know, millions of views on different videos and animated GIFs and clips like that. Like, those little assets are just something that like you can't just scale it, you know? Now, once you get something down like a Facebook ad per se, like sure you could scale that. Right. But to me as an individual or like as a company, like you have to create like real content and there's ways to speed up that process. You know, you could take an entire day and film 15 different video clips in one day. And that's definitely way that's a way of kind of like, I guess you kind of say like scaling. It's more of like, not scaling. It's really just a way of speeding up the process and, sure. and kind of you, like you're, you're creating multiple pers purposes for just one piece or a couple pieces of content. So um, in a sense, you could almost call it your personal reputation. It's something that you can't just scale. It takes time. You got to get down in the dirt and do the nitty gritty to build your personal reputation and once you get like a little piece of it, you can't just say, oh man, I unlocked it. Let me scale that. You know, there's a lot of different pieces to building a reputation and getting people to know you for a specific thing. So that's probably my best answer, man. Like, I don't know how you would scale that. I don't think it's possible. You know, like the closest you could probably think of like Ty Lopez, he spent what, a few million dollars on YouTube ads. You know, you could do that. But if you think about all the work that he put in beforehand, all these little things that he had to do, like you just can't scale that stuff. You have to actually do the work. Now, I truly believe there are definitely shortcuts you can take. I do think that there are shortcuts to success. I know a lot of people don't think that. They're like, oh, you just got to hustle. You got to hustle. Like, I think that's stupid. Um, there are big shortcuts to success that you can take because obviously I've done it um, and I've found little shortcuts here and there. So, you know, but building a reputation and, and a good one at that is something that you just can't shortcut or be able to just scale. It can't happen. Mm, that's the truth. Mike, you've been dropping a ridiculous amount of value on our listeners. If they want to follow up with you, find out more about you, your book, your Amazon Prime special, all of those things, let us know where we should go to follow up with you at. Yeah. So the good thing is number one, you can just Google my name. It's Mike Metzger. Um, but most of my resources are linked up on my website, which is MikeMetzger.com. Um, and then one thing I'd like to do, if you're offered, if your audience is open to it, you're open to it. Usually when I do podcast interviews, I'll offer them half off my first month of my underground marketing hacks program. Um, and so if you use the code podcast at undergroundmarketinghacks.com, uh, it'll give you half off your first month to my program. And what that program is, is it's not even about me. Basically I take all my connections, even my clients, people I've spoken with, uh, some of the top performers uh, and producers literally in the world, six, seven, eight figure earners, we break down different courses on different topics. So we talk, we have a course on mindset. There's a course on e-commerce. There's a course on Facebook ads. There's a course on building a digital marketing agency. 
there's a course on uh, building your credit and being able to travel the world for free by using your credit card, uh, things like that, right? And these are all real skills that I've actually learned. I don't talk about anything that I've never done. And even the things that maybe I'm not the utmost expert at, I go out and I find the expert. You know, I find the person who I'm friends with or even one of my clients that is, you know, a legitimate millionaire in that area. And I bring them in and they teach the course alongside of me. Um, and the thing is like, dude, there's a lot of people out there selling these courses for thousands of dollars. Uh, a membership to the Underground Marketing Hacks program is 37 bucks a month and that's it. Um, you know, it's not hands-on where we're babysitting people, you know, you're not going to get like one-on-one -on -one mentorship calls, but if you want to learn the skills, there are PDFs, there's videos, there's instructions. We do live calls, there's a private group, uh, and it's 37 bucks a month and that's it. And so if you want half off of that first month, which would bring it down to 1850, you can use the code podcast uh, at undergroundmarketinghacks.com. But for the most part, man, anybody can search me up on mikemetzger.com or just on social media, just search my name. Love to get connected and try to point anybody in the right direction if I can. And if I can't help you, man, I'll tell you. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, but yeah, man. Straight up. I'll be sure to link up all of those in the show notes below as well, along with that discount code for that program. Mike, do you have any last closing thoughts or words of wisdom that you want to close out the show with here today? Yeah, I think the best one is just take imperfect action. Don't worry about, you know, perfect, perfect action because it just doesn't exist, man. And you know, literally every day I see people that are getting ready to get ready, you know, mm -hmm. and they're just constantly doing that, man. They're getting ready to get ready. They're talking about ideas and shit. And it's like, dude, most of the stuff that I've done, it wasn't pretty when I started it, you know, and it didn't look good. And a lot of it didn't work. But if I never took action and just got it done, it would have never happened. So take imperfect action, not perfect inaction. It's my best piece of advice. Don't be sitting around getting ready to get ready. That's the truth. Mike, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you choosing to spend it here on Young Smart Money. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Young Smart Money. If you want to support the show, you can do so in three different ways. You can subscribe, you can leave me five, and you can share this episode with a friend. To subscribe, all you got to do is click the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts to leave me five all you got to do is scroll all the way down to the bottom of the podcast page for Young Smart Money and click on the Write a Review button. And to share with a friend, all you got to do is screenshot yourself listening to this episode, post on your Instagram story, tag me, and I will be sure to repost it in my Instagram story as well. I love giving you guys some attention who are listening to the show. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Real quick, just launched a new project called the Online Course Examiner, basically the Yelp of online courses. It is blowing up lately, onlinecourseexaminer.com. Check it out.